We have a wonderful panel here today. We're going to focus on cybersecurity uh, with respect to critical infrastructure. There are obviously so many ways this conversation could go. We were talking just before and uh, getting quite excited amongst ourselves of all the different uh, things that we could talk about today. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll spend some time with the panelists and then we'll open it up to the audience and then we'll, we'll bring it back to close. Um, so as I said, collectively today, we're looking to identify solutions to mitigate the risk to critical infrastructure in particular. Critical infrastructure, of course, being those, those asset systems and networks that are so critical the destruction, disruption, or breach uh, could cause uh, different sorts of systemic effects to security, to the economy, to health, uh, to a variety of, of core uh, elements in society. So when we talk about critical infrastructure, we think of things about uh, communication systems. Uh, we have Gavin Patterson, who will help talk about that, financial services sector, uh, Michael Bodson. Uh, certainly, we have different perspectives from a government uh, perspective. Uh, we have President uh, Ilves, as well as William Sato. Uh, and then how do we really account for the risk and the threat? And, and we'll look to, to Andre Kodelsky uh, to help us a bit with that. So I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time introducing the panelists who have uh, their backgrounds. Uh, in the first round of questions, perhaps they can add if there's any additional experience they'd like to, to add in. Uh, but as I say, we have uh, Michael Bodson, who's the president and CEO of the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Uh, we have President Tomas Ilves, from president of Estonia. Uh, Andre Kodelsky, Chairman of the Board and CEO of Kodelsky Group, Gavin Patterson, the CEO of BT Group, and William Sato, Special Advisor uh, to the Office of the Cabinet of Japan, among many other things. All of these gentlemen wear many hats. Uh, so to set the stage, uh, cybersecurity continues to be in the news. Uh, there's rarely a day <coughs> that goes by on some international newspaper uh, where on the very front page there is a discussion either about a breach or uh, recently, unfortunately, some disruptions to critical infrastructure, including uh, the electricity systems in Ukraine. Some of you might also have seen uh, there are some allegations that there were also some uh, tinkering, tampering with uh, some major dams in the state of New York and the United States, uh, perhaps from a, a nation state attacker. Uh, so we're starting to really see the, the risk of cyber change. You know, we really, I think probably 10 years ago, we thought more about very isolated attacks to specific entities, uh, perhaps around data, but, but more of a nuisance, if you will, and something that was, was easily overcome did not have consequences beyond the victim, if you will. Now as we expand, or as we expand, as the attackers expand, the risk expands, both in scope. Uh, we see data breaches now, such as the breach to Sony or to the Office of Personal Management in the United States, that are tremendously large in scope. They're quite, quite a, a massive undertaking uh, to, to mitigate. And then, as I say, we're, we're moving into uh, critical infrastructure with recent examples of actual disruptions to systems, which is something that has been feared for a long time. So this week in Davos, we talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the interconnectivity and interdependencies amongst critical infrastructure. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means for cyber. Uh, and in some, it really is uh, connoting a systemic risk. So we have systemic consequences, the possibility of cascading effects, perhaps single points of failure, um, areas where we, multiple systems, depend on one key node, which if disrupted or destroyed, could take down many systems. Uh, so to start us off, maybe I could turn to, to Andre, just give us a little bit more of his perspective on how risk has changed, uh, how cyber risk has evolved, uh, and where we might be headed in the next few years. Thank you. I will just start with one pretty interesting element. If you look at Ukraine, just when the attack has happened, we have just created in our company an index to measure what is the robustness of an infrastructure. And Ukraine is coming at the 53rd <coughs> position. Switzerland is much behind. So it's showing one key element that the risk and the probability to be attacked through cyber is not fundamentally a question of the robustness of your infrastructure and the ability of the hackers to hack. It's first an element, what is the impact of a hack? Mm. And that is what has fundamentally changed during the last 10 years, is that more and more critical elements are using internet. And there is a very good reason for it. Reason is bring, uh, internet is bringing speed, very efficient, 
cost of use, and it's allowing to do things that were impossible to be done before. So fundamentally, more you, you leverage the capability of internet, more you are putting yourself at risk. And that is bringing a pretty interesting uh, challenge, because at the same time you need to use this new technology to be competitive, and on the other side, that is creating new vulnerabilities, and so you need to improve the quality of your application, of your infrastructure, much faster than the speed at which the hackers are progressing in terms of technology, because the incentive to hack is much higher. Now, if you take also the experience we have in terms of hackers, for the last 20 years, we are chasing hackers, whatever they are, who they are. And the interesting element is that we have seen that the main motivation of hackers is not technology and to do things for fun. The main motivation is or to make money or to serve people that have ordered some specific element. So said in a different way, we see that uh, risks are really increasing due to the power of what you can distract if <coughs> you are successful in terms of hacking. But now, the way to address that, I will come back later on during my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so the impact uh, is expanding, as you say, and then uh, you know, it, the more that you use technology, the more at risk you are. I might add to that and say, in this hyper-connected world, you know, your risk becomes my risk, right? So the way in which we need to, to manage it is quite different uh, than it was perhaps 10 years ago. Uh, so Gavin, if I could, if I could turn to you, uh, there is some, the Global Risks Report reflected uh, uh, this concept of cyber risks. Uh, cyber risk was ranked uh, as perceived as the 11th uh, greatest in impact, uh, is also in terms of likelihood. Uh, but interesting, uh, two interconnected risks to cyber risks. One is the, the breakdown of critical infrastructure, critical information infrastructure, and one is the failure of critical infrastructure. We're actually ranked quite low. Uh, the failure of critical infrastructure is the second least impactful of all risks uh, in, that, in that survey. Um, but at the same time, we see through the executive survey that cyber risks are top of mind for doing business in eight economies. So from your perspective uh, and your industry, what, what do we do? How do we account for this risk? Are there best practices? Um, and, and maybe perhaps add to that flavor, what, what are the risks that you are particularly mindful of? Well, I, I, I'm a little surprised by uh, those conclusions uh, in many ways. Certainly in our business, uh, cyber risk has been top of the risk register for uh, probably five, to even 10 years now. Um, BT, uh, as many of you will know, uh, for those who don't, uh, BT is a telecoms company, uh, strong in the UK, serving all customer segments, um, but also operating internationally in 170 countries where we own networks. Uh, and uh, manage networks for, for many of our customers. And, and that gives us, uh, I would describe, a ringside view of exactly what's going on. Um, and there's no doubt that the risk is changing in its nature uh, and is becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, and the, while I think there's a recognition at a board level now, uh, I'm not always convinced when I, I, I talk to, to other CEOs that there's there's a high technical understanding and, a, and there is a sophisticated understanding about the, the nature of the risk. I think you're absolutely spot on. It's gone from being a risk which was, we've got to put up a big wall and that'll stop everything, to one which is uh, highly sophisticated, uh, where the, the type of actors have, have changed dramatically uh, and the scale uh, has increased um, significantly. So. Now, when I'm talking about this to, to, to CEOs, I, I, I point out we provided the security for the Olympics in 2012, so almost four years ago. Even then, we had to fight off 200 million uh, cyber attacks over the mm. four weeks. So since then, it has changed in its nature dramatically, but the scale has changed even over the last 18 months. So I was looking at some data recently that uh, in terms of protecting our network and our customers, uh, the scale has gone up a thousand percent in the last 18 months. So it is, it is one of the challenges you face, I think, uh, uh, when it's, it's that significant, is how do you identify the signal from the noise? I mean, it's, there's just the, sh the sheer barrage of attack means that um, you've got to be able to identify the one that can get through your defenses. 
Uh, so your ability to, to process data quickly, real time, and be able to confine uh, a threat um, rather than expect to, to um, stop every threat coming into your, your network is, is absolutely key. Um, I think the w one other thing I, I, I'll talk about and then perhaps open up uh, to other panellists is, is around the human risk um, that, that happens, and particularly insiders um, within, within companies. Um, companies, I don't think, spend enough time really looking at which individuals have um, control of their systems and their networks and could, if they, were, um, if they chose to, um, be able to implement a, a hack or, or destruction in some form from the inside. Um, so the threat is always assumed to be from the outside, but how, um, how companies are protecting uh, their employees and indeed their assets um, from uh, human error and, and human destruction, I think, is a, is a key issue. Every, uh, every company could have their own Edward Snowden as with sysadmin privileges, right? I yeah. couldn't agree more. Um, and I would say many of them have, and they've just not been... Uh, found. Uh, found it <laughs> found yeah. out yet. Yeah. So, uh, Michael, maybe we could turn to you from the financial services sector. Um, as I mentioned, uh, cyber risk is top of mind in eight economies. Interestingly, it's all the economies that we represent are, are of the eight. Um, from your perspective, you could either pick up perhaps on the insider threat or the concept of interdependencies. Obviously, we all depend on the financial services sector in, yeah. in many, many ways. I think people uh, might think of it very simplistically in terms of using an ATM, but as we know, it's much more complicated than that. So perhaps from your perspective, you could talk a bit about the risks, either either playing off some sure. of the other comments or... Well, I, I think that's the, uh, the fundamental issue is that the risks have morphed, but the risks are multi multiple in nature. There's insider risk, there's outsider risk, there's data corruption, there's system uh, interference. It, it manifests itself in so many different ways. And I see my friend Gottfried uh, Lebron from SWIFT is sitting in the audience, and you know, I, I always get asked the panels, what do you worry about? What's your, the most important thing you worry about as a CEO? I said, I only worry about one thing, which is everything. But the one thing, but the one thing I am t truly paranoid about is cyber. You know, it's the old days of, uh, there was a, a famous bank robber named uh, Wee Willie, Willie Keeler in the United States, and they asked him, after they had captured him, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. And I thought it was a pretty good answer. Um, so why do cyber attacks come into the financial system? I mean, one third of all attacks are against the financial industry. It's where the money is, right? And uh, you know, it is an industry which I think is paranoid. We spend a lot of time focused on cyber. Uh, we focus a lot on the evolving nature of the attacks, but it is very, very difficult because of this interconnectedness risk to really get your head around what, where are you going to be attacked. So if you look at Target getting attacked through an air conditioning system, I mean, how, how do you think about where your vulnerability is, where your vendor risk is? Uh, we were talking before, one of the newest risks that we're now contemplating is Regulators, in their uh, earnest attempts to understand risk, are asking us for more and more confidential information. We just got to receive requests for, give us your physical layouts for your data centers. Um, one of our uh, groups is being audited by a regulator, and they want to see the social security numbers of the senior people of the department so they can do background searches. Now, our people are saying no. Uh, you mentioned OPM. Uh, our, one of our regulators is SEC, and they were written up last year for, for, for poor practices. So, you know, the difficulty is you're sitting there, you know you're under attack, as you said. We get attacked, there's about 120,000 automated attacks every single day against the financial system of different ways. Most firms take about seven hours to process an attack. They don't do it instantaneously. Um, we found that uh, until a few years ago where we had built a new technology, we could actually just process about a third of the information about attacks on a daily basis. So you hope, to your point, you know, the noise and what's the real attack you know, one third of all this is coming through. We're trying to sift through and say, this is something I have to pay attention to. This is simply noise. So one of the things we did, and this is not meant as an infomercial, but uh, we came up with a, a product called Soltra. And all it allows, that it does is basically standardize the ingestion of information into your system so you can, you know, see which ones you really are worried about and promulgate it throughout your systems. But the next step is we're trying to create a community effect. Right now, that information you bring in is really from your vendors, your security vendors, or, or maybe the U.S. government. Um, 
But we, what we really want is the industry to band together to say, if, if I'm attacked, if I'm Morgan Stanley and I get attacked, not only will I beat it back, but I will tell the rest of the industry on an anonymous basis, I just got attacked. So everybody else starts putting up the defenses immediately. What that does is raise the cost for the hackers. And it sounds strange, but one thing that hackers can do is they do economies of scale. They can attack everybody at the same time using the same techniques. If you make it that everybody's putting up the same defenses simultaneously, you've also made that a very cost, not cost-effective way of, of, of attacking. Lastly, just one other risk we have to worry about is reputational risk for the industry. And in the U.S., there's a group that is focused on this. If a bank got attacked in the United States, it could be a small bank. It doesn't have to be a major bank. But if they got into a system and wiped out the records for a mid-sized bank in the Midwest, and all of a sudden everybody picks, turns on the news at the end of the day and starts reading about how you just lost all your money because the bank's systems were corrupted. That's the start of a bank run. Because all of a sudden somebody's going to start and say, well, if that happened in middle America, what's to say it's not going to happen against Citibank? And what's to say it's not going to happen against my local bank? People are going to start pulling money, putting it under the mattress. So this whole issue of interconnectedness is not just even if your systems are connected, but the fact that somebody who's successful against somebody similar to you raises the prospect of you being attacked successfully. And all of a sudden you get panic in the, in, in the population. That could be in the United States, that could be in Europe or Asia, it doesn't matter where. And I think that's a risk that very few people kind of thought about is just the fear factor of if it could happen there, it can happen here, and what do I do? And if it's against the financial system, the, what do people do? They take their money and they run. So, Prime Elvis, maybe I could turn to you. I, you know, the communications and financial services sector are interesting because for most of us, we have a choice. Uh, so, God forbid my bank gets hacked, I might just choose to go to a different bank. Uh, but from a national perspective, the lifeline sectors, such as energy, water, we rarely in most countries have choices. We have whatever energy provider we have in our local communities. How do you, from a nation state perspective, protect against these threats, especially given your experience if they are perpetrated by nation states? When is the appropriate time to go on the offensive, or how, from your perspective, do you partner with private sector to, to help ensure the integrity of our systems? I'll say right to start, uh, offensive actions in cyberspace I will not touch. I mean, that's just, uh, but uh, from the very beginning, uh, in fact, our entire system, even before we first had experienced one of the first uh, cyber attacks, sort of at a political level, I mean, a politically motivated cyber attack was that we had a, a public-private partnership in, in creating a, a two-factor identification system used by every, I mean, available to everyone. Um, anyone using a one-factor uh, system today, such as Sony or OPM, uh, is, um, I, I, I think it's insane. But I mean, basically, yes, we were attacked in 2007 with uh, DDoS attacks. Basically, it was just denying access to things like banks. Uh, we dealt with that fairly successfully, and we were down for a short time. But fortunately, being a small country, we had very, sort of, it was easy to call up the bank president and, uh, or the person responsible for something on the, on the government side and resolve that. The problem is that uh, the DDoS attacks, which most people and where most books these days start off on, you know, the millions of books on cybersecurity, is that that's sort of at the, the club and stone stage of warfare. Um, we have progressed beyond that uh, in terms of c cybersecurity to perhaps, uh, I mean, I'd say Sony and OPM have gotten to the point of building castles with stone walls, which it does a great job of keeping the, the Stone Age p threats away. But the problem is um, most people these days, or I mean, the, the bad guys have gunpowder. I mean, my country is littered with uh, former stone fortresses from the 13th century because they were very good in keeping out uh, Estonians from taking it over from their <laughs> from their overlords but uh, as soon as as soon as some countries or nations had gunpowder th this became obsolete and most systems today uh, I mean most people use in their emails in their company mails in their access to company or country uh, or national security related uh, data I simply work on a, on a password. Yeah. And until we realize that that does not work, that you have to do it, you, have to, you need something you know, a, a more complex. 
not, at least for a while. I mean, I'd say that where, where we are is that um, when we are moving into the Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, as the Germans call it, um, where everything is Internet-based, where all industri where industrial processes are, are, uh, are based on uh, the Internet, that we will, uh, the concern will become, first and foremost, the issue of data integrity. To make that, especially in the, <coughs> the data integrity, you talked about having financial data wiped out. Well, I mean, or you can take, uh, you know, your blood type. Uh, now, everyone is concerned about privacy, especially after Snowden, and everyone's saying, oh my God, the government can get access to all this. But in fact, one should think that, okay, you know, if someone knows your blood type, okay, or not pleasant. If someone changes your blood type, uh, I mean, are the records for your blood type, you're really in trouble. And so we must pay very careful attention to the, to da the data integrity issues which you talked about in the financial services sector, but everywhere. And, we, and the more we see our economies going over to uh, an internet base or internet of things or fourth industrial revolution, whatever you want to call it, where things are basically happening online independently of any human actors, just um, the more concerned we have to be about data integrity. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is, I think, is, will be more and more the crucial issue, even more so than theft. I mean, what we've had up to now, when we've had some huge losses, where billions of uh, dollars or euros worth of intellectual property has been stolen, um, that does not complete, uh, that's not a sort of a, a lethal threat yet. But as soon as we, s we had the Ukraine case, um, we've had a number of other uh, sort of uh, funny things we've seen with critical infrastructure uh, that I think uh, my friend Thomas Ridd, who thinks, you know, cyber, cyber war is a myth, I think that, in fact, uh, we may be entering the stage where it no longer is. Uh, and so uh, this means we, and uh, what uh, this has led us to think about at least, is we need a program of education. We need to educate our civil servants on, look people, these are things you must do. You can't, you can't operate on simple passwords. You have to convince ministries, you have to convince banks. Well, banks f f are about the only ones who figured this out, actually. Uh, but that all of our critical infrastructure and our other infrastructure, not even the uncritical infrastructure, it will have to be far more secure, and this is something I do not see as possible unless we do it at a you know, public-private partnership level, meaning there has to be legislation, but it also, for example, which I've been arguing for years, is that um, companies should not be insured unless they can prove to the insurance companies that they have taken the appropriate steps. Because, you know, if you're Sony, I mean, I don't want to sort of <laughs> get down on Sony, they're just the biggest case. But the point is that if, you're, if you have such a low level of security, why should, you, why should an insurance company uh, sort of bail you out? Um, so I think those are the kind of general trends we'll have to see. Government attention to critical infrastructure at a far greater level. Education of, of well, civil servants and companies, and finally the insurance companies really putting the pressure on the private sector. Yeah, the role of insurance is, is quite uh, interesting. I think it's still somewhat nascent. Um, I'm sure you all would agree. The, the problem there, the challenge, of course, is how do you quantify cyber risk, right? I mean, insurance is essentially based on what's a potential loss. And as we are describing with all these complexities, it's very difficult to, to pin the tail on that, right? How much would, could any given cyber attack actually cost systemically? Um, but William, I'm, I'm curious with your experience. You, you've just held a very uh, successful uh, cybersecurity conference in Japan in the fall. Um, I understand there were many uh, wonderful conversations on these topics in terms of best practices and how do we begin to work together to solve this. Um, I'm also struck uh, by Gavin's, uh, I think he said 200 million uh, for the Olympics, 200 million attacks. Um, you're going to soon be facing a, a similar potential situation. So how do you, how do you prepare? Right now, I, I, I think yeah, those are all very valid points. And the biggest point that I think 
at least from a government of Japan perspective, which is probably not unique and representative of many other uh, uh, governments, is how you really need to have a discussion, not only a discussion, but across sectors and across governments, because this is one of those first unique issues that transcends sovereignty. And you know, it, it's, it's a discussion where the National Police Agency can't arrest the bad guys necessarily, and yet they put these uh, impediments in that uh, if you do this the wrong way, it ends up being a moral hazard and, and hurts the industries that you're trying to actually support. Uh, I, I think that critical infrastructure here is uh, going to be even more critical in the sense that London, I believe, was one of the first uh, Digital Olympics uh, with the advent of the iPhone coming online and so on. Uh, given the delta between London and Tokyo, there, there are sayings that say that there are probably 50 times more data bits that will be transmitted and that everything from uh, traffic lights to sports timings uh, to you know, the safety of the audience is going to be uh, an issue. And this is very difficult really to let people know because this is supposed to be a happy thing and, and so on. <laughs> yet, yet you need to understand that there are people who will take advantage of a very prominent event and, and, and see the changes. And I will tell you that it, it used to be a much simpler world. Um, I, I, I've been in this uh, field for uh, over two decades and it has transitioned. It has transitioned, uh, I call it the ABCs, where uh, most countries and nations where I sit were worried about the ABCs, the atomic, the biological, and chemical. And it was easy because you knew who the adversaries were and it was, it was, it was somewhat tangible. But now you have the new letter D, digital, where uh, your, your opponents aren't very clear. It, it transcends sovereign borders. It's very asymmetric in nature. Uh, it's very cheap to do. And, and so these things are very difficult for countries who are in a fixed mindset to get around and changing this. Uh, and not just changing and, 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 and actually doing, but changing from a fundamental mindset um, and especially in governments where you have a situation where government officials, their job is to get it done. And so when they report up to um, senior staff, ministers, prime ministers, of course they're okay. Of course they're safe, everything. And, and, and so this is the mindset I think for at least cyber, since it's not as measurable, uh, needs to change in that this is probably the worst thing to say, that you're safe, that everything's okay, that you probably need to flip around the mindset especially from a government context, and go, no, well, okay, let's assume you're doing your job. No one is criticizing how you're doing that, but let's assume that we want to get into a more resilient posture and think about the other scenarios to do this. And I'll tell you, uh, in countries like Japan, which is very conservative and it's very difficult to think outside that box to begin with, uh, and, and to not be perceived as critical or criticizing, uh, that mindset, we have uh, less than four years to get right. But I think unless you do that, uh, it's just checking off the boxes. And I always say the moment you print up the checklist, it's outdated. And, and, and so it's how you stay on top of that. So yeah, we have a few challenges uh, remaining. <laughs> maybe I could, uh, maybe I could uh, tease out a little bit more uh, from the, the conference. Um, I'm curious about any discussions on international norms. So we've, we've talked a bit in, in, in what you're describing with this cross-sectoral need for discussions. Uh, we might similarly say among countries, we need to have similar discussions, whether it's on enforcement or working together on attribution or agreeing that there are common elements and common behaviors that we agree are not appropriate uh, in cyberspace for our, for our collective good if you will. Yeah. Um, so do you see international norms developing and how, how is we as a community can we encourage that and work towards that as a goal? You know, it has to. I, it's not the perfect model, but I think the aviation industry is a, is, a, is a good exemplar in that if every time a plane crashed and you kept that evidence to yourself because it was embarrassing, no one would have the confidence to, to ride an airplane and so, thus you would not have the industry that it is. I think cybersecurity and cyber and IT will go towards that direction in that, yes, it's embarrassing. But as Mr. President said, it's embarrassing, but it's still not life and death. It's, it's I think, uh, we need to get past that and share this information. Uh, but when you start getting around this and international norms and stuff, then you actually get into d discussions of what information and what, what, what do you consider this. But I, I think, yeah, uh, this has to be an internationally motivated, internationally driven thing, and it, it actually is the uh, information sharing that, uh, yes, it will be embarrassing, but we get that past. And, and it's, it's more than embarrassing. I mean, there are also, I mean, there, uh, quite a bit has been done. We have the Budapest Convention, which started out with the Council of Europe, 
which has now been succeeded to by the U.S., by Japan, <coughs> New Zealand, Australia. I mean, it's, it, and all that does is simply says it obligates the uh, members of the, or the, the countries that are part of this uh, convention that if a cyber, cyber criminal is located in your country, you are obligated to give him over to the country affected. But, you know, Russia has not acceded to it. China has not acceded to it. Uh, Belarus has not acceded to it. Now, at least uh, bef uh, two years ago, Ukraine I, had not acceded to it. Maybe they have in the interim, I don't know. The point is that, I mean, if you have countries that, I mean, the countries I just listed also tend to be the major source of, of the things that we are talking about. <laughs> Rumor has it. Oh, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> but the point is that, okay, so you have this, you have a, you, we have a treaty I mean, a, a good treaty for dealing with the criminal aspects of this, yet we, the, the source of the criminality is completely outside of the treaty. So this is a big problem. Um, I think that uh, an, an, the other side of this is that we have, uh, it's not only security, but we also have, this is the difference between liberal democratic and authoritarian regimes that make use of all kinds of, um, funny things. There is a slight overlap there, but I won't make it too political in between the first and the second. Uh, but uh, when we start agreeing to things, uh, as I, I mean, this is my personal view, as we saw with the ITU discussions uh, two years ago, there was, I mean, we, were, we in the liberal democratic camp were a little worried about government control of the internet under the guise of cybersecurity. Okay, this may get too sophisticated, I think, right now, but, but the point is that it, there, it's rife with problems. My own view is that we should start with the organizations that we do have that are functioning, though this doesn't touch Japan, for example, or Switzerland, but I mean, certainly the, Euro the European Union is making slow, very slow steps towards that. Within uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, very slow steps. In both cases, I would argue what we have to understand is that we have to get beyond this kind of, I mean, cyber is something that, again, countries are embarrassed. They don't want to talk about it. When they have problems, it's kind of more in the espionage realm, they think, than it is in the kind of interoperability of weapons or sort of common legal space that we have in the EU. Unless we get beyond this current mindset and get at least the community of liberal democracies, I mean, I would argue that's an important part because the countries that are not helping us, not cooperating, are countries that have difficulties with the concept of human rights and liberal democracies in general. I wouldn't name any single ones again, caveats. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that's one place to start. But this is, we have a long way to go. But we do need, I mean, we do need to do this at an international level because by, I mean, perforce, most of the bad things are cross-border. You'd be really dumb to do it in your own country. Right. People, people, sorry. I, 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 would, I would just add one point. That if we look at hackers, most of the time they will use the international connection between different countries, taking advantage of poor legislation in a way to perform uh, the uh, attacks. Now, one thing that is also key is that our legal system, and I'm speaking about in the democratic country, is pretty slow. And in internet age, speed is absolutely key. And we need to think at a new level and a new generation of legislation that is acting and transforming much faster in order to address this element, while at the same time respecting element of democracy. Yes, and I think that, that is a challenge, right, for all of us. I mean, I can speak to my experience in the States, which is that regulations take a long time. Um, it's very difficult to keep up with the pace of technology, and unfortunately, sometimes they are addressing the threat that we just had, not necessarily the threat that we will face tomorrow. Uh, so they also can have an effect on, on stifling innovation. So um, regulation is difficult. Uh, perhaps I can uh, bring our, our private sector uh, folks into the conversation to ask, how do you all, uh, from an alignment perspective, we talked about the international alignment piece, but uh, within a given country, how do you work with the patchwork of regulations. So you yeah. mentioned you have, it, it you know, patchwork. six, seven uh, regulators at this point on cyber. How do you decrease your, your cost? How do you ensure that it's actually risk-based? 
um, you know, part of this conversation I'll just throw in is that any check the box exercises, you know, compliance does not on its face necessarily equal security. So how do you how do you account for this? Maybe uh, Michael, we could turn to you first. Yeah, we were just uh, talking about that before. That unfortunately, um, legislation comes out, which is interpreted into regulation, and in the U.S., patchwork is a nice way of saying um, the chaotic regulatory structure we have where we have the CFTC, the SEC, the FDIC, the Fed, every letter of the alphabet I have to deal with uh, on a continuous basis. And then again, and rather than taking a framework that is based upon the specific risks of your company or your, your industry and seeing how you are dealing with it, it does become a checklist. It does become your, it's the difference between security and compliance. And you are focused on compliance, unfortunately. Because if you don't, you will end up in the paper, you will end up getting sanctioned, you will end up with fines, all these wonderful things. I will lose my job because the board will say I have not met my regulatory compliance. But we spend a lot of money on that, but we luckily we actually spend more money on the actual real risks. I mean, I think what you have to do is sit there and say the price of playing the game is how much you pay on compliance. But what you really have to do as management is secure your company. And understanding the difference between the two is very, very critical. But unfortunately, also you deal with outdated um, mode of thinking. I think when William went, was talking about the ABCs, a lot of the cyber rules are written thinking about a physical attack, right? I mean, a lot of the rules are based, one of the things we have to face is we have a mandate to recover from a catastrophic attack within two hours. Now, nobody knows where the two hours came from. I mean, honestly, it came in after 9-11. It was in a Fed white paper. Somebody in the bureaucracy said, sounds good, two hours. Had no basis on anything, two hours. Well, when you're under a cyber attack, one of the worst things you may be doing is turning your machines on too quickly, not understanding the nature of the risk. And again, if you're a central point of contact and a single point of failure like I am, don't tell anybody outside this room. Um, <laughs> But I could be promulgating that, that virus throughout the entire system. I am hooked up to every single bank, asset manager, et cetera, et cetera, in the United States. If I, you know, if I am corrupted and I spread that corruption, you know, all hell breaks loose. But I have this two-hour standard. Uh, and it just came out, CPI, IOSCO. We met with uh, Greg Metcraft, who's the chairman yesterday. And uh, we said, you've got to take that out. You got, that just doesn't make sense. It has to be best efforts. We understand that for us, we have to get money out by the end of the day. But don't risk the entire system just so you can meet this checklist of two-hour recovery. You know, we, we, we built our systems. We have three data centers. For a long time, we had a data center in, in Dallas that we never told anybody about. People joined us, and they thought they were joining the NSA. It was actually our third data center until we put it in the Internet, and it came up DTCC Dallas. And we said the game's up at that point. But it was all based upon synchronous replication. We have two data centers, synchronous replication. Why? One of your data centers gets blown up. Right? Okay, that makes sense. Well, now synchronous replication means you're corrupted. You're corrupted immediately everywhere. So that standard that made absolutely perfect sense post 9-11 is really something we should not be doing in this new world. But trying to get regulators to understand that, they're still worried about ABC and not understanding what D is. So communications. I get frustrated when I can't make a call in 20 seconds. Um, what, what do you do with your customers who, who are looking at holding you perhaps at an unreasonable standard, if you will, from a cyber perspective, uh, given the nature of the risk? How do you ensure availability of your, of your services? Um, well, just to, to build on the, the, the point earlier, I, I completely reinforce we can't rely on regulation to, to save us. It will never keep up with the, the nature of the attack. And uh, governments, I think, need to take the lead uh, in the way the UK government is, uh, in many ways, at ensuring that companies are properly educated on the risk. And, and the investments that the UK government are, are making around um, using the capabilities of GCHQ to um, improve our cyber defences uh, and the interdependencies between uh, companies and, 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 and government <laughs> services is, is absolutely key. This is a, a time for leadership from governments and really taking a very firm position. And I think the UK have, have, have done a good job on that. Um, in terms of customers, um, it is, I say, it's increasingly becoming an issue for customers um, of all nature. So in the corporate world, um, it is being talked about more at a boardroom level. I, had, uh, I would, as I was mentioning earlier, I, I don't think the, the dynamism and the sophistication 
uh, of the threat is, is always properly understood. Um, and we often come across situations where the CIO will tell the CEO, don't worry, I've, all, I've got it all covered. Right. And because sometimes CEOs don't come from a technical background, they say, fine, that's, it'll stop there. But whereas it needs to be much more of a debate that the board uh, engage in and, uh, and something that where people are prepared to be open and recognize that they won't have everything covered. It's about how do you respond when you do get uh, attacked. So it is, it is definitely an issue that we're seeing our customers expect us to really not just set out our, our own capabilities um, in terms of a network provider, but also um, help them um, manage their own cyber risks and provide the services um, both in terms of the, uh, the cyber defenses, but also the analytical tools to be able to, to help them protect their own, um, their own systems and their own, um, their own services them, themselves. Uh, and then in the consumer space, it is, it is becoming much more front and center. So there, was a, uh, there have been a number of major breaches uh, in the, uh, amongst um, telecoms firms in the consumer space over the last uh, few months. I won't name names, uh, like Thomas. I won't don't want to embarrass people, but it has raised the ante. Um, and you know, increasingly, I think it's going to be something that uh, you know, it, it, consumers are going to be expecting um, network providers and service providers to really set out um, their capabilities as part of the basic service. People um, think cell phones are safe, right? And more information you put on cell phones, right? But you know, everybody's worried that you do your antivirus software on your on your laptop, et cetera, et cetera. But I find it amazing that, you know, everything, my whole life's on my iPhone. And I don't really sit there and go, well, I wonder if it's safe or not, right? And the, uh, last week, Android's got, got hacked into, it's so. Worse. Yeah, it's uh, worse. It's worse than that. I mean, I would, uh, you know, with, uh, after Snowden, there was, oh my God, they're looking, you know, what's happening in our data, especially in Europe. And I pointed out to people, you know, there, you know there's no such thing as a free app. People are not out there making all these apps that you download for free because they're just doing it because they think it's a great idea. I mean, all of your personal data that you enter into that app is going out. Now, so you, and then you synchronize your iPhone with your Mac. I mean, the, the, <laughs> just yes, think about what you are doing. So you download who knows what app. I mean, you, it might even work, but, um, but, uh, I but. <laughs> because often we think of that from the perspective of how much data could be available, which is significant and a risk. But to your point, each one of those connections provides an additional vulnerability for someone to attack, right? All those interconnections. So I have no idea how many apps I have on my phone, but essentially the security of my phone is now contingent on the security of all those app providers, right? But so it's, it's a very- it's even far beyond that. First, the uh, architecture and the design of mobile phone is less secure than computers. Mm. The second element, you have these apps, but the third element, like traveler coming into different countries, you are exposed to all the type of disease and viruses. Imagine when you are traveling in strange country, you can yeah. get special disease. It's the same thing with mobile phones. And basically you go in a country, you get a virus, you come back and you can infect the rest of the uh, mobile phone population. So just think as if it was Ebola. Just yeah, think about yeah. it. Yeah, Well, on that, on that frightening <laughs> thought, um, we have about uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, what I'd like to do is open up uh, to the audience for a few questions, and then we'll turn back to our panelists, uh, perhaps for uh, some closing uh, thoughts and uh, calls to action. Um, if I could ask you to identify yourself, and if I could, please, please do ask a question. I know it's very tempting to, uh, to add into the general conversation, but just given time limits, um, if, you could, if you could make your question precise. So I'm not sure, we have a microphone here. Yes, there's one right here. Hi, I'm Yujian Park. I'm a YGL 2015 from Korea. Um, I do uh, uh, digital citizenship education for children. And I'd like to add the one, another layer of dimension in the cybersecurity, but children online protections. Um, two years ago in Korea, there was a massive uh, hacking on the financial data. And then the leak was, like you say, it's a human. So actually the employee used a thumb drive to take all the data and then sold it to the brokers. And imagine that happened to the children data. 
So now IoT happens and then the, the bio data, financial data, behavior data are all online. And there is very limited discussion about the online protection for children. So that can lead to uh, trafficking. And it is not just about the stealing money, it's stealing the life. So um, I'd like to hear your perspective about your government perspective and private sector's perspective, how we can actually uh, guarantee the safe data, pr uh, data protection for children. So I, I will open it up, uh, but uh, Mr. President, if I could turn to you. You have, uh, Estonia has amazing training programs uh, for children. Uh, and perhaps you could give a little perspective on that because I think key, my personal opinion, key to this is really ensuring that whether it's a consumer, as Gavin's uh, describing, or if it's a child going online, that they, that they understand a bit more about the risk and, and what they face. So perhaps you could. Well, I think they're separate issues. I mean, I think educating children is one thing on how to use this and what risks are. In terms of access to children's data, I mean, I think that's, that's, goes back, that's a fundamental security issue and an architecture issue. It is not possible to get the, the private, I mean, the state, the data the state has on any individual child or adult is not, a, you're, you cannot do with a dump. You can't get at it. You can get one person maybe, but, and you know who did it. Uh, it can't be done anonymously. So, I mean, those are separate issues. Educating people on how to properly use the, uh, the internet, I mean, I think that's good and necessary, but I think it has to be done not only at the national level, but at the family level as well, because, I mean, they're not gonna, you know. I mean, if you've had kids, you know that basically whatever you tell them in school, they think it's nonsense. What you tell them at the family level isn't, well, depending on their age, if they're 13, uh, they don't listen to anything you say. Uh, so. I mean, yes, education is important. I can't compare it to other countries, so I don't know what's, whether it's amazing or not. Uh, but I would say the architectural side, in terms of data protection, is exactly the same for adults or for, for seniors and there's possibly two, uh, I guess where I was headed is um, similar to when I go online, right? If I click on a phishing email, for example, or I, I click on a website that I'm not familiar with, I, there are certain behaviors that I personally could take that could be risky. A child could do the same. So helping them understand how to interact with the internet, I think is helpful. I take the president's point, though, of how to communicate that to a child is perhaps a difficult. And then the second thing, of course, as you're saying, is to the extent that there's a national database or there is a compilation of information on children, Children, uh, it's, it's probably not dissimilar to, to any so other databases. Uh, yes? I would say that with children, we have to take into uh, account the elements that for education, they need to understand what does it mean. Right. Take an example. If you have a knife, they understand that the knife is sharp and that you can be hurt. Now, one element that you, you can consider are some software that will just challenge if the children have well understood what is happening. And then only he can get educated. If you just give him some information the don't do, and without having a practice where he understand clearly what this can mean, it's difficult. So we need to have some specific software that are able to challenge if the child has well understood the lesson. Yes, Gavin. Well, I was just going to add a couple of points. Um, in the UK, all the internet providers um, work together to ensure that uh, child protection software is built into the propositions and that it's, it's, it is, it's not a thing that distinguishes one from the other. It's, you know, we we use, can use different uh, uh, suppliers, but it is something that everybody provides de facto. Number two is, I think, doing that without ensuring the education of the family around there to making sure the parents take responsibility to, to educate the children I think is absolutely key. Assuming that the software will do it and there's no role for, uh, for the parent is a mistake. Uh, and then the third thing I'd say is, is around general tech literacy. Um, there's a, I think a whole generation, um, since certainly since I was at school, there's a whole generation that has come through uh, and doesn't necessarily understand the sort of second order um, importance and, and issues around the, the internet and, and, and coding. Uh, what we need to get back to, I think, is the, the fundamentals of tech literacy and, and make that part of the core curriculum um, in the same way reading, writing and arithmetic are. It's, tech literacy should be part of what you teach every child and ensuring that teachers have the, the right capability to do that. And So one of the things we've been doing is um, 
helping trying to address that shortfall in, with, with teachers because many primary school teachers don't know how to teach this. Uh, so we've, we're working um, with the Barefoot Foundation to ensure that uh, five million school children by 2020 will have these basic tech literacy skills taught to them as part of uh, their education. I think it's, it's got to start there. Yeah, so obviously literacy, no arguments there. One thing to be mindful for, though, is that this is, at its essence, uh, a, a very difficult discussion because it, it's a debate about privacy versus uh, access. And so, you know, what do you call a child and how do, you, how do you delineate that? And so it's not an easy question when you get into that because if you do allow for this access, it also means that you're also giving up privacy and vice versa. It also means that you have this kind of system on your, on your computer. This could also be a, a venue into the system. So it's, it's not as clear cut or easy, but I think there's also that angle. Obviously, literacy is a given, but, but, some, but this part should probably not be ignored. Sir, I think we have, we have, and maybe what I'll ask is if we could have maybe one or two panelists respond, and I apologize to anyone behind me if you have a question, um, but hopefully we'll get okay. one more. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ulf Passion. I'm representing Ericsson, the world leading provider of mobile communication uh, equipment services. Uh, just very quickly, uh, mobile phones are actually safer than computers because there's a SIM card in them, but let's take that debate separately. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think that, uh, rightly so, I think that this debate has been about uh, data integrity uh, uh, because, uh, uh, of course, with the explosion of data and networks, IoT, etc., uh, uh, that will be uh, absolutely crucial. And I think it's about awareness raising. My question is, uh, uh, how do we make sure that regulators and lawmakers are actually taking this seriously and are uh, uh, putting the right regulation in, in place uh, to, to make sure that companies uh, not only are aware but actually do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with an Estonian company called Guard Time. Uh, they're very good at this, very fine data, it's not been corrupted, <laughs> etc. But I think we, we need also not only awareness raising but also regulatory uh, push here and maybe to the governments. Uh, how likely do you see that happening? Thank you. You've got to get regulators. The, the term embarrassed was an, it's an interesting term to use. But I think, you know, coming out of the financial crisis, you saw all these rules coming in, and they all, again, dealt with the crisis of the past, right? No government wants to have the same crisis occur. And, again, there's this mindset, if I stop the crisis of the past, then I'll stop all future crisis. Separate the two. And I think that same dialogue has to be had about cyber is the regulation you're writing today is solving yesterday's problem. We all want to protect our companies. We all want to do the right thing. And it has to be a dialogue. It's got to be public-private sector dialogue and cooperation. And you lay the cards on the table and say, I'm, I think I'm good here. If I'm not, don't penalize me. Help me you know, get stronger. But again, I, my fear is the regulations are going to become punitive rather than saying at the end of the day, we're all, we all have to be you know, tied at the hip to get these things right. And it's got to be global. And it's got to be uh, private-public. The problem we're going to have is that's easier said than done. You can use the FSB, for instance, Financial Security Board. Um, that's a different <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, other, the other FSB. But, you know, but you know, there are forms that could be utilized. But the question is, you know, do they have the willingness to take on this issue? Because they may be embarrassed because it's a hard issue to get your head around. Well, let's, let's do this in the, the remaining time. Uh, I, I, let me uh, first describe briefly what I heard, uh, and then perhaps I could ask each of you in a, a quick lightning round uh, to <coughs> perhaps give one or two calls to action, if you would, um, of how to address this. But I think we talked a lot about the role of governments, uh, both internationally working together, the Budapest uh, Convention being an example, as well as internally, how do we align and eliminate patchworks of regulation, ensuring at the same time that regulations are both risk-based and forward-looking. Uh, and don't become result in compliance checklists. Uh, we talked about the importance of education, uh, both from a hygiene perspective, um, you know, not uh, relying solely on passwords, uh, two-factor authentication, also this, this idea of tech literacy and how do we instill at a very young age uh, this new brave world uh, that, we, that we now live in. Um, we talked a bit, of course, about public-private partnerships, so how do we all work together and what is the appropriate role of the private and the public sector in that. Um, and, and maybe I'll just stop there and, uh, and turn to Michael. What, what would be your one to two calls to action uh, to help us address this risk to critical infrastructure? I think, uh, one, policymakers understand the difference between physical threats and cyber threats, and we're still not there. And, you know, try, not trying to apply one standard to, to both. And two, there's this hard concept of don't look at the past risk, look at the future risk, and work with industry, be it telecoms, be it 
um, finance or whatnot to assess what the potential risk is, not what the risk of the past was. A topic we didn't actually discuss here, but I see increasingly as a problem is, I don't know, stove piping. I mean, basically, within companies, within, within ministries, between ministries, and then we get ultimately, I mean, the ultimate manifestation is, you know, sort of stove piping between countries on whether, uh, and until we actually at least find some, first of all, we have to start in the beginning, that even in departments and ministries or in, departments and departments would finally sort of agree on uh, on what the approach should be and then you need the the various ministries in the government to do this to work then with the banks I mean actually the banks I shouldn't you know they're actually the most progressive on this because they have the most to lose in the short run uh, or at least they have the they understand what is at, at stake so data integrity is not an issue you, I ever have to explain to a bank never I mean they okay. uh, but uh, the rest of the private sector, you know, when we think about data integrity, I don't want to take too much time, but I mean, there are things uh, such as uh, traffic lights. There's one case where they, in LA, they hacked the lights, the traffic light system, and fortunately, what they did was they turned all the r lights red. Now, can you imagine in the city of Los Angeles, you turn all the lights green? But the point is that, but traffic lights, it's such a basic, simple, you, know, you don't even think about it, you automatic, your foot responds to the light. I mean, it's, uh, you know, critical infrastructure is, I mean, rather, the critical infrastructure is a much broader concept than we normally uh, think about. You know, we think dams, power stations, well, think about your electrical, lights uh, traffic lights, nice. and uh, that, um, as we move into this new uh, era of IoT where everything is done over the internet, that uh, we really have to think very close, much more at a broad level with cooperative thinking on where to go and not fight, as you said, yesterday's war. And especially because we don't even know what the next issue will be. For the last five years, the European Union was only really concerned about, until f March, the Greek financial crisis. And now, you know, that's, that was f it's completely forgotten. Last March. I mean, <laughs> so it's, it, the, these things change quick. We have to be r sort of mentally Flexible. resilient. Right, right. Andre. Yeah. Yeah. For me, two important elements. First element, only government or only private cannot solve the issue. So there is a real need of a public-private partnership, but not on a country level but the more, on a more global level, where speed is absolutely essential and access to information. So there should be a platform in order to exchange the information about what are the potential risk and how it's, it's the fastest speed to be able to address them. The second dimension is regarding the compliance and the regulator. I think that fundamentally, people that need to check if a system is secure enough or need to design a system that is secure enough must not think as compliance officer, but must be able to think as hackers. A hacker will not look at a computer system in the same way as a compliance officer. And we fundamentally need to change this behavior. If not, we find good excuses and people to blame rather than solutions. And that is, for me, a key element to make a more secure internet. Thank you. So now we're, we're super lightning speed for our last two panelists. <laughs> William, what, what would be your call to action? Yeah, so two quick things, just to keep things in perspective. I, there's a lot said. Everybody's probably frightened and running home and so on. But to simplify, really, what security is for me and what everybody should like look at this is that's really a triangle of balancing security, cost, and, and, and usability. And so, I, you know, one of the things that I look at and tell people is that not necessarily what you're doing is a security issue, but it's actually a usability issue that causes a security issue. Cost, of course, is given. So that's one. So to, to look at this holistically in that it's this balance that people don't recognize sometimes and, and take security the wrong way. You know, 30 character passwords is a usability issue. So, the, and then the final thing that I would add there is that uh, cybersecurity is not a technical problem. It is definitely a management issue now, and so it's to look at it that perspective. Uh, in a word, step up engagement. Um, engagement at a boardroom level, uh, engagement between companies and, uh, and governments, um, between governments and governments, and in, you know, engagement with uh, the general population, and as we talk particularly 
uh, young people as they come through. I think we've got to make this much more front and center as you know, the key threat, or one of the key threats of our time. But that was a wonderful way to, to end. Uh, we do encourage you all to engage in whatever, uh, whatever your life's uh, work might be. Uh, this really is a problem, I think, that not only affects us all in terms of its, its scope, but it's something that we can all contribute to. So I'd like to thank the panelists. Uh, I'd like to thank the forum, of, of course, for hosting us. And thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your day.